see you all here. Uh, why don't you take a moment to say hello to one another? <laughs> Traditionally, the third Sunday in Advent, if we had a, a, a pink candle, that would be the pink candle day. Uh, it's uh, the Sunday of joy. And the reason we have reason for joy today is our God is with us. And so uh, we rejoice in that and uh, we begin by singing the first hymn. let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ Jesus died for all our sins, rose again from the dead, and will come again in glory. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And children, it's that time. Come on up. When I look at you children, I see you're happy all the time. Is that right? You're happy all the time? Huh. Well, I have to say I'm not happy all the time. 
Sometimes I'm happy, and sometimes I'm not. If you had a puppy, and your little puppy got run over in the road, that wouldn't make you happy, would it? No. And if you've done something wrong, and your parent tells you, oh boy, that probably doesn't make you happy either, does it? No. And are there times when you're maybe mad? Yeah, and you're not happy at that time either, are you? No. So, is it possible for us to be sad or mad and yet full of joy at the same time? Yeah, that is true. We can still be full of joy even if we are sad or mad. And the reason we can be that way is because we know that even if we do something bad or somebody, something done bad to us, God still loves us. God still cares for us. He's with us all the time. And that's what's so wonderful. You know, the Apostle Paul tells us in the epistle lesson for today, epistle is his letter to, uh, to the Philippians. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. So we can be sad, and yet we can still look to the Lord, and as we see him, oh, we can be happy. We can be joyous in God. In fact, when I think of joy, I think of something that some students from Lakeside Lutheran High School taught me and a whole bunch of other people uh, many years ago now. Think of joy, and you think of the J, that stands for Jesus. The O stands for others, and the Y stands for you. And if we put our life in that order, thinking first of Jesus, and then of others, and then of ourselves, then we'll have true joy. A joy that will last. A joy that will show in our lives now, while we're here, and someday, a joy when we'll see Jesus face to face and be with him forever. So, that gives a real reason for thumbs up, doesn't it? Yes. Oh, yeah. I hope your basketball games went okay. Uh, oh, well. Lost all three. Oh, well. Hey, you can still have joy in Jesus. <laughs> Here you go. Two for you, and there's two for you. And it's a joy to sit up there with the kids. Because of Jesus and what he's done for us and for the entire world, we can rejoice each and every day, no matter what the circumstances. And instead of worrying or being stressed out, especially at this time of the year, we can take everything to God in prayer and enjoy the peace that he has put on us and in us. And as he is with us, he gives us that peace. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, 
present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God. John the Baptist leads us all to repent of our varied sins, just as he did so for the Old Testament people, and to turn to the Lord for forgiveness and for life. Our gospel lesson is recorded in the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 3, beginning with the seventh verse. Please rise for the words and works of the Lord. <clears throat> John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, <clears throat> anyone who has two shirts should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. With many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated and we sing the next hymn. <laughs>
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God that we'll consider today is the Old Testament lesson for this Sunday, recorded in Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning with the 14th verse. Sing, daughter of Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. This is the word of God. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, it's no secret that guilt can really be a tough thing, can it not? You might feel guilty, especially at this time of the year, if you can't get the kids what they wanted or you can't get them as much as what you wanted to give them or because you got them more than what you could afford or more than what they, you really should have gotten. You might feel guilty if you're so busy that you don't have time to spend with your loved ones. You might feel guilty if you haven't gotten your Christmas cards out yet as I haven't either. Uh, uh, you might feel guilty if you realize the whole year has gone by and you had made the best intentions to keep in touch with a certain someone, but it didn't happen. You might feel guilty if you haven't been to church as many times as you would have liked. You might feel guilty about these or any number of other things and wonder about your relationship, not only with others, but especially with God himself. And of course, as soon as you start feeling guilty, that produces fear. You begin to be afraid of what others might think, or even about what God himself might think of you. Well, in the midst of all that fear and guilt, we have the Lord himself telling us that even that guilt can be for your good. And he tells us our God is with us. What a terrific thing. Could there be anything better than that? Giving us reason to rejoice, and God is rejoicing with us. The fact is, is that you and I, when we look at ourselves, realize we are guilty, at least before God, while looking at our relationship with friends and relatives, well, when we're convinced that we haven't really uh, upheld our relationships with them as well as we could have, then we need to consider our relationship with our best friend. And how well have we kept up our relation with God? When we hear the Lord has taken away your punishment, he has turned back your enemy, well, <laughs> we're reminded that we deserve punishment while we're here on this earth and forever in hell. Aren't there times that we're tempted to ask, why me, God? Why did that good seem to happen to everybody else but not to me? It seems like everything goes wrong for me. Why does that happen to me? And just at such a time, if we really seriously consider our relationship with God, shouldn't we rather be asking the more obvious question of, why not me? 
what makes me so special that God should pay any attention to me whatsoever. After all, he knows that you and I are just dust and will return to it because after all, he made us. And he knows that. In fact, when I think about my sins, I'm drawn to the 130th Psalm. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. We fear, we revere, we hold in awe the God of mercy and God of love who even though we sin against him regularly and he should pay no attention to us due to our sins, he remains our merciful, forgiving God in Christ Jesus. Wow. How does that blow our minds? And yet we hear the prophet Zephaniah say, Sing, daughter of Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. Now the fact is, is that daughter of Zion or daughter of Jerusalem is the same as saying, O oh, you, members of God's church, sing and rejoice. And then he gives us the reason why the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. Instead of treating us as our dust deserves and treating us like garbage and throwing us away, he literally says here, he throws away our enemies like garbage. And what are our enemies? We're not nations here. We're talking about enemies you and I have, not pretty people, but our real enemies. The devil, all his wicked angels, the sinful world around us that keeps on trying to fight against us, our own sinful nature. God throws that all away. Then our awesome God of mercy declares, the Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. You know, during Advent, one of the hymns that we sing is the thousand-year-old hymn. It's been sung by Christians for that long. O come, O come, Emmanuel. And in that hymn, we remind ourselves that Emmanuel will come, and so that's the reason for us to rejoice. Emmanuel, God with us. We think of the words of uh, the angel in Joseph's dream to him, letting him know that uh, the virgin would conceive and give birth to that son. It's an astounding thing that we can rejoice and be glad. We can rejoice. You know, earlier I told the children about the joy that we can have in Jesus and in helping others and then putting ourselves. Well, what can take that joy away? Could the loss of a loved one and the mourning over that person take away our joy? No. Especially if we know that that person was a believer in Christ, we know we'll see that person again in heaven. So what can take our joy away? And some bad thing that happens to us in life? Not really, because we still have Jesus. A child may lose joy, however, if the child is growing up in a very poor household and is afraid, afraid that he or she won't get any presents for Christmas. A child may grow up in a household that's abusive and, and gets beaten on a regular basis, that may bring about a loss of joy because, after all, they become afraid of life. It's only fear 
that reduces our joy. But the fact is, is that we have a God who tells us he won't forsake us. So as long as we know that, we can still have joy. He says, never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion. The Lord your God is with you. The one who has always been with us as God is always the one who uh, will continue to be our God and be with us. And so we don't need to fear punishment because God has taken care of that for us. That's what he promised the Old Testament people. Well, we New Testament Christians know that he followed through on that promise by sending his own son to assure us, and we think of that especially at this time of the year, of sins forgiven. But what about the people of the Old Testament? What about those who didn't live long enough to see the Savior? Well, Paul addresses their sins in Romans chapter 3. God presented as a sacrifice of atonement, presented Jesus, him, through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just, and the one who justifies declares us not guilty, all who have faith in Jesus. That's why David, for example, was so certain that his Savior was going to be born and, and rescue him from his sins, even though it was a thousand years in advance, that he wrote, let me hear joy and gladness let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. And right after our text, God assures us through the prophet Zephaniah the sorrows for the appointed feasts I will remove from you. For they are burden and a reproach to you. God had commanded his Old Testament peoples to do all kinds of rules and regulations and had to obey the ceremonies in just certain ways all the time. And it was a burden to them. And God knew it was a burden to them. And yet he still commanded them that this is what they needed to do as his Old Testament people to prove their obedience to him. Well, we New Testament people of God have the privilege of being able to serve the Lord without all those rules and regulations that these Old Testament people had to obey. So God in that way really replaced the fear of punishment with the joy of serving him freely through Christ. When Jesus was to be born, Joseph was reminded the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. But you know, it gives us special joy to realize that not only was Jesus God with us while he was visibly here on this earth, he is still God with us today. And that's why I call attention to his words before he left this world visibly. Surely I am with you always to the very end of this New Testament age. It's all ours because of Jesus, God who is with us. Remarkably, Zephaniah tells us that also means 
that God is rejoicing with us. You know, we parents are especially happy when we see our children happy, right? Doesn't that bring an extra happiness to you? Just seeing your children happy? That's, in fact, the reason why when we give them gifts, it's all the more reason for us to realize those precious words of the scriptures, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We learn that through experience. So that brings up a question. How can we please God? How can we give any gift to God and be a blessing? After all, God owns everything there is. There's nothing you and I can give God that isn't already his. And yet, you and I do give to God. And we give to God because we recognize everything is his. He wouldn't have to divvy out any of it to us. But by his grace and mercy, he does. And so we give a portion back to him and say, to God be the glory. It's a wondrous thing that he allows us to do that. But there's also another way that God gives us to give. Give to him by giving to others. And in a way, Zephaniah calls our attention to that here. Do not let your hands hang limp. We've probably all heard that old expression, idle hands are the devil's workshop. Well, think about it. When you and I let our hands hang limp, when we do nothing, we don't really do nothing, do we? We start thinking then. When our hands aren't busy, we start thinking. And what do we start thinking of? It doesn't take long before the devil and his wicked angels start planting in us evil thoughts and trying to lead us astray. And so it's better to keep busy instead of letting our hands hang limp to do the work of the Lord. And as we do his work, we need to draw on his strength in order to fight against all those evil temptations. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. As we recognize that God is with us every minute of every day, we can use his power, we can use his strength to fight off and ward off all evil. And, you know, we'll want to eagerly strive to gain perfection, to be perfect. Will we ever reach it this side of heaven? No, of course not. But even though we don't reach it this side of heaven, nonetheless, we still strive to be perfect because God already sees us as perfect in Christ. And so we want to live up to, in his sight to all of this. And when it happens that we realize we have not been perfect and that we have failed miserably each and every day, then the wicked angels come to us and try to convince us, well, as long as you couldn't be perfect, you might as well go ahead and sin. And then you say no. The mighty warrior who saves me is with me. So, as we look for things to keep us busy in the Lord, we'll want to bring joy to others by serving them in any way we can, just as the Lord has served us in so many ways and bringing us joy in Jesus. We'll want to pray for our unchurched friends or relatives or acquaintances or neighbors that somehow that joy will be brought into their lives. Jesus and others 
and then yourself. We'll also want to share the good news of Jesus with them. And that might mean also inviting them to the children's service next Sunday. Make sure you take the extra effort to invite others to come to that, to rejoice with us as the children also bring us the message of Jesus. And, of course, invite them to our candlelight service on Christmas Eve or to our Christmas service two weeks from today as well. As we draw joy from the Lord, well, then we'll also want to share that joy with others. But amazingly, what Zephaniah tells us is that not only do we draw joy from the Lord, but he draws joy from us. So much so that he wants to sing. Just as we are happy when our children are happy, so God is happy when his children, us, when we are happy. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. When you're happy, you might sing. Well, especially if you have a voice for it, huh? And I know some of you say, oh, well, I couldn't carry a tune no matter what. So instead, in your mind, you think of a song and you sing it in, in happiness and joy. Or you sing it in the shower, even though, you know, somebody else in the household might hear you. But nonetheless, to God be the glory. You sing because of the joy you have inside of you. Well, what this tells us is not only do we sing when we're joyous, God sings as he looks at us and enjoys what he sees as he delights in us serving him and serving others. So, we really don't have any better reason in the whole world for rejoicing than in the fact that the Lord is with us. So, my friends, in our dear Savior God, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
pray. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, Spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Lift up our hearts in joy and anticipation. We give you thanks, O God, for all that you have done for us and for all that you graciously give us to use to your glory. Help us devote our time, our talents, and our treasures to praise your name in all we do, say, and even think. My times are in your hands, O Lord. May I use my God-given gifts to serve my God. And Lord, we pray also at this time that you would continue to heal the many that are sick with uh, the pandemic uh, around our area and around the world. We ask that you would also be with all of those who were hit by the tornadoes recently. Be with them and strengthen them. Calm the hearts of those who lost loved ones and those that lost properties, that in all of this, your name may be glorified and more and more may come to know you, our gracious Savior God. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Good morning once again to you all. I'm glad we could be here. Uh, please note the announcements. Uh, choir again on Saturday and a week from uh, tomorrow is our uh, council meeting. And of course, our children's Christmas service coming up this coming uh, Sunday. And uh, hopefully there'll be a good practice uh, today. Uh, uh, so they'll be ready for it. Um, our Christmas Eve service is at 6.30, and uh, no Christmas Day worship this year, so we're going to have our other Christmas service the following day on the 26th, so uh, we hope you can join us for that as well. Uh, and uh, before, before I leave, thank God we still have as much freedom as we do, even though it it is very much being threatened in our country right now. Uh, so, I know that wasn't part of the joy, and yet, on the other hand, we rejoice that there are those Christians standing up for Jesus, in other parts of the world especially. God's blessings. Mm -hmm.